leave it to Amir and off we go. Thanks, Malroy. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start by the same question which I asked er earlier that uh, about how many years being involved in peace. So I think I've been involved in peace more than 10 years. And during this uh, lifetime of working with the persistent identifiers, I've seen the growth and uh, kind of transforming the metadata space of the research and scholarly communication networks from um, just uh, disconnected repositories to now an interoperable connected network of links between different repositories, connections, topics, grants, and publications. So in this, publica in this um, presentation, we're going to actually use some of those, uh, plus graph database, plus Python, plus a graph visualization tool called Giphy to see how we can actually get the data out of this system and how we can basically analyze the graph. Now, on my background, my background is computer science. I work in the research sector uh, in, in general about 18 years. Uh, right now, I'm actually leading a research team at Swinburne. So we work with uh, big data sets, big collections. Uh, interesting enough, right now, a lot of our projects are related to the uh, social activities, and there's a lot of social science background. So the collaboration network of people and their activities is something that is a core of a lot of our research components some of it even goes outside of the research space like the finding the relationship between directors interlocking connections across the board and different organizations but in the context of this presentation we're going to only stick to the uh, orchid doi and scholarly communication network so on that one uh, um, uh, melroy has put a poll that talks about what is your interest as I'm going through the slides, uh, I will look through this, and based on that, we spend time on which one of these technology we want to talk about it the most. Uh, but let me start by sharing my screen. Also, I have seen during the conference, sometimes the uh, screen sharing has some problems. So please let me know if you have any problem of actually reading the materials on the slides. It's a lot of uh, kind of code involved in this talk. So, Earlier in the conference, uh, in the, uh, during the Peter Palooza, Melroy talked about the COVID Research Collaboration Network. I hope you have seen that presentation. I'm not going to repeat that. But the gist of it is that if we pull the information out of the Crossref and the scholarly communication networks, uh, there are about 230,000 publications right now with the COVID uh, coronavirus uh, COVID SARS uh, version two, and all the different variation of term terminology related to that in the body of the text and the literature abstracts and titles. And this together links to 46,000 research organizations across the globe. So really the gist of this presentation is that when you have access to all of those data, how you can get the graph like this. In a very simplified model, the collaboration network, when we talk about activities like this, it really comes from two researchers are co-authoring a paper, and then these researchers are connected to different universities. So it's a very, very simple model, uh, but the publication is not the only form. So we have the papers, we have the data sets, we have the grants, so two people can co-contribute to a data set two uh, researchers can be the co-investigator of the publication. In the context, just to simplify this, in the context of this presentation, I will only focus on uh, authorship. But what you see or what you saw earlier from Melroy presentation, this includes everything. So uh, right now we are only focusing on slides of this to make it digestible. Now, Basically, what we have done is that we use a cloud platform that we have. It's run um, a number of different uh, connections to the persistent identifier. It's called Research Graph, and it's kind of a uh, PID graph plus lots of other publications and a uh, form of a scholarly communication that they do not have an identifier, like gray literature per se, blog posts, uh, Twitter feeds, uh, lots of internal projects and uh, funding activities in universities that they do not actually have I, uh, persistent ID yet. Um, now, we basically feed uh, this engine with the list of um, uh, keywords and uh, basic terminology that we knew it's related to the COVID. Uh, it linked those information across the ORCID cross-ref data site and then basically produce a graph database. And in the course of this 
the next 10, 20 minutes, I'm going to show you how we can actually get data out of that graph database. So basically, we're going to focus on this part. We have the graph database. How are we going to use it? So we're going to look at the, uh, the new 4 j graph database, that it is a graph database. It's, it's an engine, like a SQL database or Oracle database. It is a form of a uh, um, repository for metadata. Then we are using a Python programming in Jupyter Notebook to transform the data in a way that is digestible by the visualization system called Gephi. And then we're going to dive into the Gephi. Now, everything I'm going to explain is that currently is actually available on Azure as a virtual lab. We are doing a beta test on this. Uh, I'm not going to use it for the just whole point of in, I think doing a demo in a presentation and then using the cloud are too many risk factors. Uh, I'm going to use my machine. Everything is installed here, but everything I'm repeating, uh, so everything I'm exercising here can be repeated through the Azure cloud. If you're interested in this one for a beta test, uh, contact me. So I'm going to actually switch to the process. Now, while I'm doing this, um, again, hoping the text is readable. Uh, on that point, let me just check, look at the polls. So uh, the graph database, there is a, uh, a lot of interest here. And then followed by ETL, and then followed by, oh, actually, no, the, also graph visualization. So we're going to spend less time on Python. OK, so the data that I mentioned, uh, you should be able to see my entire screen now. It's sitting in a graph database that's called uh, Neo4j. Now, Neo4j has a desktop edition and also has a cloud edition. Uh, you can have a multiple different graph databases hosted in it. Again, I, in the scope of this presentation, I cannot kind of teach the entire Neo4j structure. But suffice to say that when you actually use a Neo4j, your data is sitting in a graph structure. Now, when you have the Neo4j, you can basically open that structure as a browser. And you can see what is in your uh, graph ecosystem. There are, in this case, are labels attached to different things, are colorful labels that tells you the data from Crossref, the data from data sites. We have DOIs, we have Fondref data, we have Grid, we have Orchid. And what you can do in this in space is that you can start typing a language that's called Cypher, things like, well, I want to know, tell me some publications. Uh, that where I want to be sure that they actually have uh, and uh, DOI, so I want them to have DOI, and then return um, return those graphs actually, and then I can actually and um, always in a big graphs so you want to limit the results, otherwise you're going to be a lot of things coming out of it. So uh, you would get the graph. So far, it's simple. Now, in the graph that you're looking, uh, there is a huge number of nodes. There are more than 340,000 nodes. Uh, it's too much for printing this out. But for the size of the graph, this is actually not that big. It's easily manageable in a sizable VM. The visualization of this would be the more uh, taxing on the CPU. Now, uh, the, the language that I type and call Cypher is actually there's an easy way to cheat, and that is basically the cheat sheet for this one. Neo4j published a guideline that basically almost tells you everything that you need to know. Have one of these in front of you, then you can start typing queries. Um, now, one of the tricks around the Neo4j space is that basically there are two main concepts here. One is that then you have a graph, when you're going for nodes, it always tells you what are the properties you can get from it. And uh, that plus that uh, small documents, that would tell you sort of things that you can do. Now, I put the link for this one into the slides uh, here. So you should be able to access this after this presentation. And the aim of this whole exercise is that everything we are going to do is, is going to be reproducible. Now, uh, what I'm going to type, instead of typing into Neo4j, I'm typing this in a Jupyter Notebook. And this Jupyter Notebook is already on GitHub, so you can actually access that. So when you actually run a set of commands in the Jupyter Notebook, there is a bit of setup here. I'm going to skip this part. This is a standard interaction with the graph database. I'm going to get to the Cypher queries. So the first thing we want to know is that what do we have actually in this graph database? And the answer to this is that we basically have 233,000 publications, uh, 58,000 researchers across 47,000 uh, organizations, and 18,000 data sets. And 
I want to emphasize that going back to what we have seen in a number of presentations in this conference, it's all about peaks. So these are the researchers who do have ORCID, and these are the organizations that have some, some, some sort of identifiers and data sets that have a DOI. Obviously, this is not all the researchers that work on all of those publications. A lot of uh, researchers that are involved in this publication, they do not have ORCID. So there is a gap in this uh, kind of exercise. Uh, and by the way, the graph database that you see right now is the latest version of ORCID that is about two or three weeks old, or two weeks old, I think. So that might relate to some of the numbers we're going to see later on. So now on that note, uh, there is another query that you can type, and this is where the cipher comes together. It says, well, I, have, I want to know basically the connection between these nodes. And here you can see the number of connection between the publications, researcher and publication, publication researchers, organization researchers, and so forth. So this is a graph after all. And because of that, you can see this interconnectivity between different nodes. Now, I'm actually going to skip through this Python because of the poll that I saw. So I think I don't, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, the thing that are important in, in this kind of, and again, the code would be available online, is that you can actually see um, the, the trend of publications, for example, in 2020. Like this is what happened in January, February, March, and going all the way to December. And you see the Feb, in February, March, there was a decline. Now, given the context of the research graph when we work into this ecosystem, we know that the uh, February, March, usually in the publication cycle are actually sometimes quite quiet. So this is following the same nature, uh, but then it has been quite consistent. The other thing is the number of paper has been published per year. And 2020 has been amazing, 139,000 papers compared to the previous year, there was only 600 papers about this topic and then 400 and 300 and so forth. So now let's assume we have done all of these analytics. We want to actually get the graph out of this system. Now, what we can do is that we can, there is, again, relatively simple, but I know that the screen looks like complicated. There is a cipher query that follows the same thing as I presented in this slide. This model, relatively. The researcher connected to publications, publication related to universities. Of course, this researcher also is connected to another university. So in this space, we say to the graph engine, tell me the list of organizations who have researchers and those researchers have published a paper that has a DOI, and that DOI is connected to another ORCID record from another researchers, and that researchers belong to another organization. We, in this case, want to get this graph for the organization that are from Australia. So I'm focusing only on Australia. And for that point, uh, I would basically export all of those things that I asked for, and I export this one in a file. And basically, you run this, and it tells you, I'll give you a graph. That graph has 13,000 nodes and 25,000 relationships. So we got our graph. The graph is already stored in a file. Uh, we have done the same exercise for US uh, to find a collaboration network of US. Obviously, the graph is far bigger in this topic. And we will see in some of the visualizations that US and UK are dominating uh, players in the field of publishing related to the COVID-19, uh, which is obviously no surprise in that space. So for a uh, collaboration graph of US includes more than 49,000 organizations. Now, just another uh, clarification in this context, in the universe of um, research graph, we basically look at the organization not as a, a main entity, as all of the branches, like for example, if the Swinburne University has a branch in California and has a branch in Indonesia, they are separate organizations. So all of those subsections or separate research group that they got separate IDs, like ISNI ID, they would consider as a separate organization. So that's what uh, kind of, um, so there is a hierarchy in these numbers that are not captured in the data. Now, we have exported these two, and now we are going to actually go to the visualization part. So if I jump into the graph, so there is a tool that's called Gephi. Gephi is a Java-based visualization tool that uh, we have used this for a number of years for research. It's quite capable. You can do a lot of graph analytics. But in this case, we are just doing a simple visualization. So uh, the data that we exported sitting in a format of graph ML files. So I can first open the uh, 
uh, Australian graph. Uh, it tells me a number of different discrepancies. Basically, in the graph database, they don't have a type. This system automatically matched them to the string. We are not worried about that. Uh, the graph is not directed. It's undirected graph. Uh, and it tells us there are 13,000 nodes and 25,000 relationships. And we open this, we get the big blob of black dots, which is not very attractive. Now, to fix this, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to basically, uh, we call this one, change the layout of this graph. And there are many ways of doing this. For this one, I'm going to choose a force atlas mainly because it is the quickest one. It uses the multiprocessing algorithm and is quite versatile. So we basically run this, and the graph expands. Now, this can stop now. So we have basically how the, the graph layout basically now is expand. Then we see some hops here in the nodes. These are the ones that basically forms the clusters. Um, now, as I am doing this, let me do a rain check with Melroy. Melroy, is the screen sharing on my screen is fine? Can everyone see the screen properly? Yes, I can see your screen properly. Occasionally it blurs, but most of the time you can see it. OK, so I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll pause between different steps, because that's what I learned is that screen sharing also has that problem. If I quick switch between things, it's, um, it gives some headache. OK, so now we actually color code this now. We talked about countries. So we now know that we have country value into this. We're going to use it to partition the graph. So we say color by country. And null means uh, uh, in, in this graph, only organizations they have country. Publications and researchers, they do not have a country, uh, the way that we exported that. So uh, I just make them just to go black. Uh, obviously, we need to change then one of our blacks to different colors. So we have the US as green, AU as light blue. Uh, we have UK uh, as dark or navy colored. And we have Spain, Germany, and Italy. And then we also have India here. Let's give them the yellow color. And then we color code this. So we've got some color in the graph. It's still not quite visible. The next stage to make this one more useful is Basically, there's a concept in the graph visualization that you can resize the nodes by the degrees, which is a number of edges that go through a node. That means the more connected is a node, the bigger is going to be uh, actually the size of the node. So now it's changing. Actually, 20 is a lot. Make it five. Get us more reasonable. OK, so now we see something more visible in this graph. Now, I said we don't know what are these nodes. So one way of doing that is basically say, well, I want a label for these things. So I will in check to see uh, in the Gephi space, you can identify the what properties uh, define the label. So as I want to know the country, and there is a key value for all the research graph data that usually is a PID plus the source or a combination of those that makes this globally, or global is the wrong term, it makes it in the research graph clusters unique. Um, now we want this for nodes, and now if I move my mouse, I can actually see this is University of Melbourne. So if you remember, the light blue was the Australian universities, uh, Monash University. Again, my apology if that's not quite readable. And then I move this one to UK. This might be University of Oxford, and then you can have University of Cambridge, and so forth. Now, uh, what the other thing is that also in this graph, you can see all the underlying nodes get highlighted when you click on something. Now, there's a term in this uh, word that we say we can turn off the light. What we're going to do here. So the graph is more visual. Um, now, here, if I click on something again, now you can see the expansion of this in that space. Now, if you zoom out, out of this graph, there is one thing else we should do before starting to think about printing that. One is that the city is too dense. And also, some of these things are overlap. So obviously, we want to prevent overlap. One phase, things are getting apart. The other one is that you want to scale a graph. I would say probably based on what I see, this can be scaled by the factor of 10. So rather than 20 or 2, we get 20. So we run it. And actually, I'm going to turn on the light so you see what I'm doing. And then graph expands in a way that makes it more digestible. At some stage, when you're satisfied with the density, we can stop. So we have a separate clusters here. 
Now, when you have a graph like this, um, and when you turn off the light, now you see the colors. Going back to our partition, we can see the US cluster, you can see the uh, Australian cluster, and you can see the cluster from UK. Now, one of the things that are actually important is an understanding of the closeness of these nodes. Now, in our Jupyter notebook, uh, there was a command that I didn't go through it. So when we look at the um, when we look at the organizations, uh, I ran a query here for the uh, Australia that shows a list of the all other countries that have done collaboration with Australia. Now in this case, what you see is that US, uh, UK, Australia is in the third place, and so forth. So the top partner with Australian universities on the topic of COVID is not Australian universities, it's actually United States, following by uh, researchers in UK and then Australia. Now, this has been a pattern for so many countries. We have seen in this particular topic of COVID that there is always a cluster of research, but a US and UK are the exceptions. Every other group, especially some of the US group, they work together, British group also work together. Now I found another exception, that is actually India. If you look for the collaboration graph of India, actually the Indian universities are in the top of the list. So it's more likely than this topic that a researcher from India collaborated with another researcher in India from another university. By the way, we are excluding inter-university collaboration. So this is all about the collaboration from researchers in two different universities. So if I work from one university to another university, if I'm in India, more likely that the second university on the topic of COVID would be in India compared to US or UK. Now going back to our graph, uh, there is a preview phase here that you can actually um, make these things more, I call this printable. <laughs> So this is the one that we often use for publications or uh, more friendly graph visualizations. Um, and it's, to some level, it's quite useful to actually get something that can be nicely put on the uh, um, on your paper. Now, uh, this whole thing, the actual value, which we are not going to actually get time to go through this, the different filters that you can do on the topology of the graph the number of uh, algorithms that you can apply about the structure of the graph. So you can actually slice and dice the graph in different ways. Uh, this is not going to kind of fit in, in our time right now. Um, but there is a lots of kind of videos on YouTube about how to use Giphy for graph visualization. Once you get your data or your PEAT graph in this concept into the Giphy, then uh, kind of the possibilities are endless. Now, on that note, if I get back to slides, I'm, um, I just want to repeat these things uh, that this page is going to be your friend, uh, the, the Cypher uh, factory in this case, or we call it Cheat Sheet. Uh, and the code is available in the GitHub repository. Um, and I think the presentation is going to be also shared after the, uh, pres uh, the, the slides is going to be shared after the presentation. And if you want to get involved in this, uh, to access the VM, uh, right now, you basically the only way that you have is that you need to contact me and send me your uh, Azure ID so I can actually add you to the uh, list of authorized users to um, spawn the VM. And obviously, this needs to be in your own capacity. So it needs to have your own Azure account to run it. Uh, on the code, the code is available. Everything that we put on the code is here. And if you are interested to work on this particular uh, COVID collaboration graph, you are working on two uh, papers in the topic. One is related to the structure of the graph, and the other one is related to the different topics in the graph related to how much of these papers related to the vaccine, how much of this related to the social impact of pandemic, how much of this actually relates to the things like mental health and other um, side effects of COVID. They're all captured in the body of the literature and actually tells a very interesting story of what countries and what universities are mostly interested in what areas. Okay, on that note, I'm gonna stop here and open this for uh, Q&A. I hope it hasn't been too technical while at the same time conveying the message. Thank you for that, Amir. Okay, so now we can ask real questions.
So ask him one, ask him five, go for it. So So thanks, Flip. I like. Uh, I'm glad that you like this. Um, also, I can see Martin is here. Martin Fenner from Data Site. Well, I can assure that uh, there were some Data Site data sets were in our graph. So Amir, uh, I had a question. Oh, there are a couple of questions. Yeah, I'll let me read them for that and then I'm going to get back to you. So did you have to prepare the data a lot before having it as a graph? So Philip, the short answer is um, yes, um, but it's, a lot of it is automated. So uh, the research that my team is doing is a lot of it is related to this scholarly communication network. So that's where the research graph come to play. And we have a pipeline that continuously cleans the data. Basically, the graph that they maintain right now has 600 million ages across all of these DOIs, its uh, ISNI records, the grids, and all different of different ones. So we continuously curate and clean this uh, in a way that we can use it for our own research, and that's where the effort gone. But um, the, the thing about this particular version with COVID is uh, we are basically make it, we are going to make this one publicly accessible so anyone can use it and the plan is also to continuously update this with some reasonable interval um i hope that was uh, that answers your question i'm going to the next one from tommy uh, can you annotate the age between two nodes with the type information exactly the um there can be many different relationships types between us yes that is right you can do that you can color code them uh, the other one thing is that when the data comes back from the Augment API, it actually compresses multiple relationships into one. And uh, this uh, th this doesn't actually make that sense for the research and publication. That's usually one. But within the research and organization, there are multiple formats. I, I can uh, both study it and be employed by the same university. So uh, what you saw in that graph was flattened graph. Uh, but you can actually have the whole expanded graph that shows all the all the edges, uh, which obviously means more dense graph. Okay. So, sorry, Melroy, you were going to ask a question. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, this. So my question was with regards to uh, all the presentation that you did. Uh, and the Neo4j uh, cheat sheet, as well as the uh, Gephi database. Is there, I mean, do you have any tips for those who want to indulge themselves more with these sort of graphs, what they need to do? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's a good point. Before I answer that, before I forget this, well, actually, related to the same concept. Uh, the cross ref metadata, data site metadata, and ORCID metadata has been amazing in making all of these things happen. So I don't know if anyone here, apart from Martin from the Crossref and Orchid, uh, it's my special thanks to what all of you guys are doing. Uh, I, I have seen in the last 10 years that the metadata is continuously improving. And because of that improvement, the resolution of these graphs gets richer and richer, and now we have much more accurate data. Uh, now, if you actually kind of want to more dive into this, um, Data site and Pete Graph has already done a lot of work around the, uh, something that called GraphQL, which is also connected to Neo4j. So combination of these two are quite powerful. Uh, exporting the data from uh, any of these engines to the Neo4j plus GraphQL helps a lot in that activity. Uh, now on the Giphy part, it's easy, it's quite easy. So I think the Giphy, the real best friend is YouTube. Like there's so many Giphy presentations. Uh, uh, on YouTube, that's actually how I learned when I was a student, and that goes back to almost 25 years ago. So that's how long is that tool? And by the way, 25 years ago, it was still better. Still, it is better. Uh, I just saw that Philip raised his hand. I don't know if that's. Uh, do you do you have another question, Philip? No, oh, I think that's a thumbs up. Oh, thumbs up. Right. Um, cool. 
All right, then I think this brings us to the end of this plenary session. On behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank you, Amir, for this great presentation. I'd also once again like to thank both yourself and Richard, especially Richard on telling us more about how ORCIDs affect researchers, not generally in ways we see, but uh, as a researcher, you have a different perspective. And Amir for showing us that uh, persistent identifiers are very useful when we want to find out more information, at least rather than manually searching for them by visualizing them. So thank you both of you all once again. Hopefully you have a good evening and everyone